Very well. So um, now we try to finish this uh, chapter with a few last uh, topics on uh, broadcast channels and superposition coding. So um, at the beginning, we have posed the problem in terms of uh, uh, two private messages and one common message. Then we have uh, focused on the achievable region for the private message only by superposition coding. And now we can uh, obtain essentially for free as a byproduct the capacity region for uh, private and common messages for the degraded case. So in the degraded case, we said that um, um, channel is degraded if one user can stochastically emulate the output of the other user and therefore he can always pretend to be the other user, which means whatever the other user can decode, also the better user that can emulate this um, can, can, can decode, which means that we can take the message uh, dedicated to the um, bad user and split it into a part that uh, is common, so in interest both, and a part that is private. Which means that for every, for every rate pair R1, R2 in the capacity region of the degraded broadcast channel, the triple R0, R1, and R2 minus R0, so this will be the new private rate for user 2, and this is common, is in the capacity region of the common message. Um, so with, with, with common message. On the other hand, it is easy to uh, show that um, this is also vice versa. Uh, in other words, any, any rate of this type uh, can be mapped into uh, a rate point on this type uh, because, uh, again, uh, the common rate can be just dedicated to uh, user 2 and uh, at this point uh, user 2 can, can decode it because it's common which means that in fact there is like a one-to-one um, -one map we can take any any rate pair r1 r2 and we can uh, you know from the uh, private rate capacity region we can construct the common message capacity region in this case so the result is that uh, the capacity region of the degraded uh, broadcast channel with common message is given by the convex hull of the uh, closure of the union of uh, region of this type. This is a three-dimensional region because we have common rate, but you know, it's defined by these two inequalities. And then you take, as, uh, as usual, the union of all possible choices of PU, PX given U, take the convex hull, and this is the capacity region. So another relatively simple generalization is to go for from the two user case to the K user case. So a physically degraded K user uh, broadcast channel is defined by a probability uh, transition uh, mass function that is a p of y1, y2 until yk given x. So in other words, it's a channel with one input x and many output y1, y2, yk. Mm? Uh, and it is physically degraded if there exists a Markov chain for which uh, every Without loss of generality, we can take the order of degradation in one, two, three, etc. And so on, there is this Markov chain, which means that essentially the output of user k is obtained from the output of user k minus one by further stochastic degradation by, for example, adding noise. Hmm? So uh, in this case, the individual. Um, 
individual message uh, capacity is uh, given by the commerce closure of the k tuples of rates that um, obey the following inequalities. So R1 uh, less or equal than the mutual information between x, y1 given u2, and in general rk is less or equal than the mutual information between uk, yk given uk plus 1. So for a choice of the auxiliary random variables that uh, obey the following, uh, the, the following things. So, um, uh, you see, we have essentially we construct a Markov chain uh, u k u k minus one until ta 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 ta, ta until until u u two x. Um, so <coughs> this choice for the uh, auxiliary random variable basically uh, corresponds to the generalization to k levels of the uh, superposition coding that we have seen for uh, two levels. So in other words, in this case, you would start from uh, u capital K, u capital K uh, we construct um, auxiliary code in the alphabet U capital K with rate uh, RK for every code word U capital K we construct an auxiliary code book in the alphabet U capital K minus 1 for every code word here, we construct an auxiliary code word, an auxiliary code book uh, in the alphabet U, K minus 2, etc., 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 until at the end we have U2, the review U2, and then we construct code words in X. So at the end, the code word sent X of messages M1 comma M2, comma M capital K will be simply one point in this last level of, of code words, but the sequence of messages here basically indicates that, uh, you know, M1 picks up a point in here, uh, uh, then M2 will pick a point uh, inside uh, Pick, a, pick, pick one auxiliary, uh, one of the auxiliary codebook here, M3, etc. Et so uh, it, it's a hierarchical construction. Of course, it's very complicated to, to imagine, but if you think um, in terms of addition, we have something that is very, uh, very commonly done. Uh, for example, th there is a scheme called CDMA, code division multiple access that works exactly like that. We have we want to transmit uh, simultaneously to K users and the transmitter will have a, a bank of encoders. These are for example binary encoders or whatever encoders encoder one, encoder two, until encoder K. These are information bits, so bits. These encoded symbols are then mapped into waveforms through a process called the spreading. This is simply creating lower rate codes from high rate codes. For example, if they say, for example, these are binary codes of rate, I don't know, one half. And uh, here we get symbols that are plus and minus one. So with the so-called BPSK 
modulation, right? Uh, at a certain symbol rate. So at this point, you know, we, the modulated waveform is uh, uh, like, for example, something that looks like this, right? Like a digital waveform of this kind. And then here we use a process called spreading. So we multiply these symbols by spreading codes who are waveforms that look like random noise and flip at a rate which is much higher, which is called the chip rate. So for example, you know, the spreading code would be something that looks like this, right? So it changes very, very fast. So each one of these symbols then is, you know, the, the, the multiplication with the plus and minus one changes the phase of this uh, waveform so we get uh, the, the waveform with the positive phase and the negative phase but uh, the waveform itself has a much larger bandwidth because it changes much 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 faster it changes uh, so this is called the symbol rate and this is a symbol interval ts and the rate at which uh, this waveform, the, the spreading code changes, is called the chip rate. And the little interval uh, for, for every oscillation of the spreading code is called the, the chip interval, Tc. And the ratio Ts over Tc is called N, is the spreading gain. And this is, corresponds to the bandwidth expansion factor. So the, the, the bandwidth of a signal that, that has transitions at intervals at Ts is roughly speaking 1 over Ts hertz. So say, for example, if Ts is, uh, for example, 1 microsecond, this is more or less a 1 megahertz bandwidth. But then we can go to, say, uh, maybe Tc is, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 nanoseconds. Okay, so we have a spreading factor of 100, which means that the bandwidth of the modulated signal after spreading is 100 times uh, larger than the bandwidth of the information bearing signal at this point before the spreading. Then all these things are uh, superimposed together, maybe with different power coefficients. So we allocate here the power, so we, we allocate power, uh, you know. Uh, some, with some amplitudes, uh, for example, A1, and then, sorry, A1, then A2, AK. So at the end, we, we superimpose these this, uh, signals with different uh, powers. And here, this is our transmitted signal, right? So that's exactly how we form a superposition code for the... Um, for a broadcast channel. Now, what I said, say for example that the users are ordered such that uh, the SNR at the receiver of user one is greater or equal than the SNR at the receiver of user two, greater or equal, etc., etc., right? Until we get uh, the worst user, user K, right? So it means that. Uh, we have this degradation because in, uh, uh, we, we can think of the output of uh, user uh, k as uh, the output of user k minus 1 plus additive noise. So this is stochastic degradation, but we know that the capacity region is equivalent to the physical degradation, um, which means that, uh, uh, say, user 1 can decode all the signals. User 2 can decode all the signals, but the signals of user, of user 1, and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, we will have that uh, the worst user decodes its own signal, treating everything else by no as noise. Then the second worst user will uh, will uh, decode the signal of user uh, K first, and then decodes its signals and treat everybody else uh, as noise. So essentially, uh, every user uses successive interference cancellation and successive decoding um, uh, until it decodes its own signal. User, user 1 will uh, eventually, you know, decode all the signals and 
finds its own signal uh, in a interference-free conditions. And this is called the successive interference cancellation default. And, and this is a, a very, I would say, practical way to implement precisely this uh, K-user degraded Gaussian broadcast channel uh, in a scheme that uh, is used in, uh, in 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 practice, uh, for the in, in fact, it's not okay. We have to make a lot of distinctions here in 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 the in the practical world. Uh, successive interference cancellation is used in certain circumstances, but it's not in a very common use. So typically, people uh, in CDMA systems use a suboptimal decoder, with, uh, which does not achieve the capacity region, which for which every user treats everybody else as noise without trying to cancel interference for the uh, coming from the signals from the worst users. And then there are several several uh, tricks, several practical tricks that make uh, essentially because of complexity. But in principles, these uh, these uh, problems and, and these approaches of uh, so called multi-user uh, detection or interference cancellation have been studied. There is a vast literature on that, and uh, that's uh, you know, uh, especially on the encoder side, uh, the superposition of signals to transmit simultaneously to many users in different SNR conditions. Uh, is done is a uh, in fact is the basis of the so-called 3G systems, mm, so-called Y-band CDMA, and has been widely studied and implemented in practice. Mm. So we are not talking about something completely science fictional. There is uh, some uh, direct relation to uh, technology. So in the Gaussian case, as I say, um, it is. Uh, with the same approach of using uh, the, the entropy power inequality that we have uh, done for the two-user case, it turns out that uh, the choice of um, the auxiliary random variable to be jointly Gaussian uh, is optimal, and uh, which means that basically if we make the, the user codes at this point before superposition as independent Gaussian and be superimposed altogether uh, with coefficients such that the overall uh, transmit power here is, is, uh, is satisfied, this is an optimal uh, capacity achieving strategy. And the resulting uh, K-user Gaussian broadcast channel capacity region is a uh, exactly given by uh, rates uh, with a satisfying inequality of this type and here you see exactly the interference cancellation uh, that I was talking about because this quantity here so this is C is the C is always log of 1 plus the argument here so this quantity here it can be seen as the so-called signal to interference S I N R of user K signal to interference plus noise ratio. Let's see how it is. We have alpha K times S N R K. This is the S N. This is the effective signal power normalized by the noise variance of the desired signals for user K. And at the denominator, we have 1, which is the normalized noise variance. And then the effect, so the, as interference, so treated as noise and therefore acting in the denominator of the signal to interference plus noise ratio, the contribution of all the users with smaller indices because these users, sorry, this should be like this, uh, uh, Oh, this is not a typo. This is really K, yeah? because uh, uh, you remember in the two-user case we have we have uh, detailed the where is the gumption? Yeah, so you see that uh, uh, that formula generalized this one, right? Uh, because when you put K equal to one, the sum of the denominator is empty, and we have just uh, alpha one SNR one, and then uh, 
uh, alpha 2 here is 1 minus alpha 1 and therefore it, it, here the, 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 the second the second line would be uh, alpha 2 SNR2 plus one, uh, divided by 1 plus alpha 1 SNR2 because SNR2 is uh, the SNR of uh, at receiver 2 mm? so uh, and, and alpha times SNR2 is the effect of the layer for user 1 at receiver 2 mm? so that's not a typo um, and here you see that this formula generalizes precisely that formula because for k equal to 1 we will have alpha 1 SNR1 for k equal to 2 we will have alpha 2 SNR2 divided by 1 plus and this sum at the denominator contains only the term for 1 because it goes from 1 to 2 minus 1 which is 1 so it has only one term alpha 1 SNR2 and then it will be uh, the, next, uh, the next user alpha 3 SNR3 divided by 1 plus alpha 1 SNR3 plus alpha 2 SNR3 etc etc so uh, this is uh, this is the effect the effect of the not cancelled not cancelled interference that acts as noise while all the users with the higher indices can be decoded by user k because of the order of degradation and therefore do not appear in the SINR for user k that determines its rate. Mm -hmm. So you see that this formula reflects exactly the successive interference cancellation that I was uh, uh, talking about before. Good. So um, now, generalizing uh, and going to a larger classes of uh, broadcast channels, well, in general, we have uh, the family of all broadcast channels uh, and for which the capacity region is not fully known in general. Then we have uh, talked about uh, very in details about this family, so the, the, the graded broadcast channel, which is a subfamily. And then it turns out that there are two uh, nested classes that are called less noisy and more capable, for which um, superposition coding is still capacity achieving, at least for the two user cases, for which the capacity region for the two user case is known okay and is achieved by superposition coding the definition of these channels is the following now this is a little bit intricate I will go a little bit uh, you know in the surface because these are details uh, let's say a little bit more uh, delicate and purely information theoretic with less maybe less uh, direct impact on uh, on uh, real systems but okay it's nice to at least uh, have a few comments so the two user less noisy channel is defined as uh, channel with one input and two output and a transition probability distribution and it's called less noisy if the following uh, property holds for every PU PX given U forming a Markov chain U X Y Y Y 2 so essentially for the setup of uh, superposition coding the Mutual information between U and Y1 is greater or equal than the mutual information between U and Y2. Now you see immediately that uh, this is true for the degraded case. Because for the degraded case, well, think about this, the, the physically degraded case, we would have the, a Markov chain U, X, Y1, Y2, 
for which it's obvious that the mutual information between u and y1 is always greater or equal than the mutual information between u and y2 for any such distribution of uh, u and x. In general, we may think of uh, a wider class of channels for which this condition is true in terms of the mutual information, but for which the Markov chain may not hold, or there may not even be a stochastic de degradation, so uh, for which the user user one cannot stochastically emulate the output of user two by adding independent noise, but still uh, we, we have this sort of uh, uh, ordering of the mutual information for every possible distribution of uh, uh, u and x. If this happens, the channel is called less noisy in broadcast channel. Um, the more capable is um, even a larger class for which this condition uh, holds for every input distribution Px. So without uh, any um, auxiliary non variable, if the mutual information between x and y1 is larger than the mutual information between x and y2 for every px, then we say that uh, the channel belongs to the more capable class and we say that the user 1 is more capable of user 2. Okay? Again, the degraded case is a special case. So we have this sort of nesting uh, of, of, the, of, of the broadcast channel families. Hmm? Um, it turns out that uh, superposition coding is optimal for the less noisy and more capable channel and the capacity region is the convex closure of all points satisfying the rate achievable by superposition coding and notice that uh, uh, here we don't have to take the union with also the uh, other region exchanging the, u the, the role of the user because the users essentially are ranked. User 1 is better than user 2 in some sense, whether it is you know, in, the, in this ordering of mutual information. So uh, uh, while the general achievable region for a general case, the achievable region for superposition coding also consider the union when you reverse the, the role of user 1 and user 2. In this case, this is not needed. So it's just a convex closure of uh, the points satisfying these uh, inequalities uh, for all possible uh, distributions, um, all possible distribution PU, PX given it. So the fact that this region is achievable is already proven. That's the general achievability uh, of uh, superposition coding we have proven uh, uh, before. So all we have to do is to prove that this region is optimal. So we have to prove a convex. And uh, because of the fact that the more capable is a larger class of less noisy and the region is the same, we prove the, the convex for the more capable case. And this automatically will uh, apply to the less noisy case because less noisy is a special case of more capable. So we have the proof of converse for, for more capable. And uh, we start with, so we have here a uh, bunch of identities, uh, the rate of user uh, 2 is. Uh, you know, uh, the entropy of the messages of user 2, the joint entropy of the messages user 1 and user 2 can be decomposed in this way and can also be decomposed in this way, right? And by introducing, um, introducing um, you know, fun inequality and uh, basically adding and subtracting, for example, in this case, we add and subtract the uh, conditional entropy of a message given uh, what is used to decode that message, right? And knowing that this term 
because the probability of error in the converse, we assume to have codes with vanishing probability of error, this term is uh, upper bounded by n times epsilon n, then the difference between this and this is the mutual information between m2 and y2n, and similarly we end up with, um, with uh, other fine inequalities for um, basically by, by characterizing uh, both here and here. We can write these two inequalities here and here again by adding and subtracting vanishing terms. Um, so um, now this converse is uh, fairly involved. Uh, I will go through it uh, relatively quickly. This is uh, just to give you a flavor of how complicated these converse proofs can be. Um, so let's work out uh, on the second inequality. So the second inequality is the sum of two multi-letter mutual information because we have here the messages and we have the full uh, sequences of uh, uh, at user one and user two. Uh, and we want to single letterize this expression. So first of all, we apply uh, the chain rule to the first mutual information and to the second mutual information and we, and we arrive uh, at these uh, two sums. Then the issue here is to somehow make, you know, appear like we have done in the converse for the degraded case, something that uh, can be identified as auxiliary uh, random variable u. The problem is what is the auxiliary random variable that uh, makes the magic. And uh, of course, you know, and this has been found when by the people who prove this result, and it's not easy. That's uh, you know, something that you see uh, evidently. But of course, we can just you know, go through the steps and see how the steps develop. So first of all, um, we want to, at the end, have some common terms. And they, they appear in the conditioning in one term and in, uh, inside the mutual information in the other term. Why is this? Because we expect to find something that will involve something that we can relate to this mutual information for which the u appear in the conditioning and this mutual information for which the u appears inside as argument of the mutual information. Huh? So how do we construct this common uh, variable? Well, um, here we can uh, take the um, you know, take this uh, the, 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 the first term the first term here, this term here, and we can write it as the, um, we can essentially, um, basically, add the, some, 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 some variables, so we, we essentially augment this by adding this, uh, this part inside the mutual information. Every time we add a variable in, in, in the arguments, the mutual information increases, and, and uh, you see here that uh, yeah, the conditioning remains the same. For the second terms, for the second term, uh, we have simply, um, we can simply uh, write it in, uh, uh, you know, this term act in the conditioning, right? So if we bring it inside here by the chain rule, you now if you take this term here and we break it into I M2 and um, so the other way I y2 i plus 1 n and y2 i plus i m2 y2 i given y2 i plus 1 n you see that this term is coincide with this term 
and we have an extra term here. So basically we have that this term is less or equal than this, and therefore here we have an upper bound. Okay. Then we break uh, further uh, the, these, these terms by uh, basically, basically, uh, okay, the, this, the, the, the first term remains the same, and here we break it, uh, we, we, um, we basically consider again, if we write this term, we break it with the, uh, with the chain rule, it is equal to this plus this, so at the end we can write this as uh, uh, this term minus this, right? And finally, we have finally constructed um, by by basically uh, uh, putting together putting together uh, all, all the terms. So we have we have here you know these uh, these, these uh, uh, variable which is uh, you know m two the future of y2 from i plus 1 to n and the past of y1 from 1 to i minus 1 okay and this appears here and this also appears here in order to so and then we have this term here is just replicated here and now you see that if you take uh, the, the this plus this makes that okay so at the end we have identified two terms for which there is this common strange configuration of three uh, objects m2 the past of y1 and the future of m2 that appears here in the conditioning appears here in uh, uh, as the argument of mutual information and then we have these two extra terms that are uh, in green, which in principles have nothing to do with each other, but the miracle of this proof is that this term, this sum, not every single term, but when we sum over all i's, this first sum here with the plus and this sum here with the minus, cancel exactly each other. So the sum of these two is zero, okay? So these two cancel using uh, an intricate result, which is called the Caesar sum identity, that uh, is stated as lemma 24 in the appendix. You can see the proof, uh, and it's precisely like that. It, it shows that the, these two sums are identical. Um, so that's a really key step and without this Caesar sum identity is uh, basically impossible to proceed. And this is perhaps uh, one major obstacle that prevents the generalization of these results to more than two users, because there is no Caesar sum identity for, for scenarios with more than two users. So there is a one, one example where you can prove an exact result for two users, but it does not generalize. And, uh, unlike the case of the, the graded uh, channel for which we have proven the result for two users and then we have the generalization for the general k user case mm -hmm. here uh, the, so basically at the end these uh, green terms cancel by the sort of uh, miracle analytical miracle that is called the Caesar sum identity and we end up with just the blue and red terms that are written here for simplicity where now we have a clearly these two terms are identical and can play the role of the auxiliary random variable. So we can just call this ui and here ui. And it is important to, to, to see, and with this definition, it's important to see that we are not breaking the uh, Markov chain dependency. In other words, uh, we have ui xi y1 i y2 i forms a Markov chain. Mm -hmm. is, uh, so whatever definition of auxiliary random variable we have, 
it cannot break this the, the this thing because otherwise if we would break this 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 condition then we would introduce some sort of a hidden uh, channel from UI directly to the output. We, well, we know that whatever is done at the transmitter must go through the input of the channel to reach the output. Okay, so the, the, this is a condition for manufacturing valid uh, uh, auxiliary random variables. And in this case, it, it works because the channel is memoryless. So when you condition on the input at time i, whatever messages and uh, output input at, uh, at the past and future times have no influence because you are cutting the dependency here. So you see that UI contains only message, the past of the uh, Y1 sequence and the future of Y2 sequence. So at this point we end up with, uh, with this um, uh, with this um, inequality, uh, we have bounded uh, the the sum n times r1 r2 by the sum of inequalities. Sorry, the sum of mutual information obtained by the i marginals uh, with uh, uh, or induced by the, the code. And, uh, uh, and therefore for some distribution of the variables ui, xi, y1, y1, y1i, and y2i. Mm -hmm. So we can work out the first inequality. The first inequality is simpler because we can immediately uh, basically induce here uh, uh, ui, which is the same as before. So we have uh, here we have bounded nr2 less or equal than the sum from 1 to n of the mutual information between ui and y to i, where ui, of course, it has to be the same definition of before. And for the third inequality, uh, we can uh, use any... So, so far we have not used the more capable condition. You see, we, it doesn't appear anywhere, but uh, uh, here is where we use it. So uh, that's why this proof does not generalize to other classes of, uh, of uh, broadcast channels that, uh, uh, that because uh, here basically we can follow exactly the same steps for the second inequality because you see the third inequality essentially is an inequality that bounds the sum rate but for which the role of uh, message one and message two have been exchanged. You see that there is a symmetry between these two. So we can follow exactly the same steps by exchanging one and two. And at this point, we will uh, manufacture a new auxiliary random variable that we can call vi, which is, when you compare it with ui, you see that uh, ui contains message two, Future of Y1, sorry, um, hey, this is, this is a typo. Oh my goodness, this is a typo, this should be a minus. This I minus one. Past of Y1, future of Y2, and, um, and, and, and uh, um, VI uh, contains uh, the, uh, basically the, the same thing, but has, uh, M1 instead of M2. So we end up with uh, something that is very similar to, uh, to, what to what we have before. So if you compare these inequality with what we get from the second inequality here, so we have x, y1 given u and then u, y2, and here we have uh, x, y1, given v. Ah, oh my goodness, it's full of mistakes. This should be a 2. OK. OK, I will correct this. It's, uh, clearly, I was not very pay paying very attention when I wrote this. It's easy to get confused, honestly. 
So we have x, y2 given, given v and then v, y1. They all have to be exchanged. And I have also a dot here that maybe this should be a 2 and this should be a 1. But OK, question mark, I will check. OK. But at the end, uh, this auxiliary, this uh, sort of ghost auxiliary random variable v is not needed because here is uh, uh, basically uh, what uh, what we ah no 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 uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm already stupid I'm getting I'm getting confused that's the inequality I wanted to have which is the the right one with the two and the one the one is here the two is here. But here is the key step. Here is where we use the MC, so the more capable condition, for which we can say, okay, since the channel is more capable, then if we exchange Y2 with Y1, we get an upper bound. Because for any possible distribution, VI, XI, uh, uh, Y1, I, Y2I, uh, uh, this mutual information is always less or equal than this mutual information. So at this point, uh, uh, we have that uh, by, by basically exchanging y2 with y1, we get an upper bound, and then we put these things together. And so this would be, you know, the mutual information by, by the chain rule, this would be the mutual information between v i x i and y 1 i, but because there is a Markov chain vi, xi, y, 1, i, it turns out that this is equal to this mutual information because we can, we can write it as mutual information between xi and y, 1, i, uh, and then plus mutual information between vi, y, y, 1, i, given xi, which is zero because of this Markov chain. So this gives us the last inequality. So, okay, so that was, uh, sorry about that, I, I got distracted. Yes, this is important, that for any such distribution, we have this, this ranking. So concluding the proof is that, uh, uh, first of all, we noticed that uh, the, the, the auxiliary random variable that we have constructed is um, satisfied this Markov chain, so it's a valid auxiliary random variable. Second, uh, by usually going to the time-sharing argument, introducing the variable q, and then putting everything everything together, we find that uh, if r1, r2 are achievable, then they must satisfy these inequalities. So we have inequality for ray 2, and then this, this sum inequality here, uh, and this sum inequality here, and this is exactly the region that we have seen before. And in addition, we can even prove the cardinality bounds, which of course are more complicated than um, the case for the degraded channel, which was already complicated. So, okay, this is a, admittedly a very, uh, very complicated result, but it shows basically the uh, um, the, inf the, the, the optimality of superposition coding for this class of more general broadcast channel, which is called the more capable channels, for which the not necessarily degraded, but uh, some sort of extension. As I say, this result does not extend in general to the case of three users, which is kind of frustrating. And the key step is this uh, Caesar sum uh, uh, identity for which that cancels these two green terms uh, for, which, uh, uh, for which we do not have an equivalent for three users or more. Um, okay, a last result that I want to talk about for which superposition coding is also optimal is the case of a general broadcast channel but with a condition on the messages which is called degraded message set. So what is a, cha a, a, a broadcast channel with degraded message set? This is exactly the, the case where we want to deliver just one common message and one private message to one of the users. So that's a, a, precisely the case of um, 
you know, we are in, in the discussion on Zoom, we have uh, uh, talked about, uh, uh, you know, digital TV broadcasting, where uh, we can transmit a standard definition TV to some, uh, to some users, and then some other users uh, may be able to receive uh, refinement. Huh? So, for example, R0 is, uh, is, uh, is the common uh, message and uh, R1 is just the refinement for some users. In this case we have two users so in this case we have that uh, R0 is uh, uh, is, uh, is common and uh, R1 is private for user 1. User 2 only wants R0. This is called the graded message set because in a certain sense you may imagine that if uh, we have a string of bits, okay, we may say that the first n R0 bits are common and then the remaining n R1 bits are only for user 1. So in a certain sense, user 2 gets a subset of the bits of user 1. So there is this degradation in the message, in the sense that one user wants a subset uh, of the bits of the other user, okay? Um, which is precisely compliant with the idea of having, you know, high definition, uh, uh, say, uh, standard definition, common message, and uh, high definition refinement message. Okay, so um, the... The result in this theorem says that the capacity region of a general uh, broadcast channel, so there is no more capable condition, no degradation, nothing. There is only this condition for which one user wants a message and the other user wants a, the same message plus a private message. Uh, the capacity region is the converse closure of all rates obtained by, uh, defined by, by these inequalities uh, for some uh, distribution, so you take the union over all possible PU, PX given U, and this is obtained by superposition coding, because that's precisely the uh, achievable rate uh, obtained by superposition coding. So, um, the achievability is a standard superposition coding. Um, for the converse, the converse is, uh, is interesting. Uh, uh, we can... Uh, basically consider uh, an uh, al alternative reparameterization of the same region by we see that by taking the union over all region of this kind this is the same as taking union over all region of uh, of this kind where where r0 is less than the mutual information between u and y2 r0 plus r1 is less than the, uh, the, the sum of these two mutual informations and then this uh, so uh, basically, these regions here, this region here forms a, oops, well, you can, you can, uh, you can write it and you have an R0, R1 for every choice of P, U, P, X given U, in general, you have an inequality for R0, which is given by this mutual information. Then you have an inequality for R1, which is given by this mutual information. And then, depending on this mutual information, this may have you may have a, 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 an inequality for the sum. So in general, you may have a, a region that looks like a, a sort of a pentagon like this. Then uh, um, of course, you know, um, you may have cases in which uh, uh, the, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so in the, then, then you take the union of all possible uh, distributions. And now if you look at the regions of this kind, uh, they, they look a little bit different because now we have um, two inequalities for the sum, but you see the problem is that uh, 
this term may or may not be larger than, than this term. So basically, uh, you have uh, in the basically regions that uh, look similar. These regions are, are only of, of, this, of, of, of this shape. Uh, there is one inequality for R0, and then there is one inequality for the sum. So there are regions of, let's say, this kind. Okay. But it turns out that when you take the union of all possible uh, uh, distributions, the union of region of this kind is the same as union of region of this kind. And when you take the converse, uh, the, the converse closure of the union of all possible. Uh, and um, so that's another, it's, it's, it's a, another way of, uh, of, of writing the, the region. And then basically uh, the converse uh, goes along line very similar to what done for the more capable uh, case and it uses also the Caesar sum identity. Uh, the last point I want to make here is um, a note on um, an approach that is called rate splitting which by the way has had a very, a very big traction in the in the past few two three years in uh, information theory applied to communication. So now people talk about rate splitting as a technique for the downlink of uh, cellular systems, for example, and um, a technique called Fourier-Motzkin elimination, which is very much used in uh, multi-user information theory, which, uh, which is a general uh, technique to basically reduce the dimensionality of a system of inequalities. So the idea is that we want to prove in a direct way the achievability of a region of this kind, so defined by these three inequalities, rather than by these three inequalities. Um, so we want to prove in a direct way that the region for the uh, degraded um, message set region of uh, this kind, so when R0 and R1 uh, satisfy these three inequalities for some distribution PU, PX given U is achievable. And in order to do this, we are going to use the following trick. So we take the message M1 and we split it into two sub-messages, M10 and M12, at rates R10 and R, sorry, M10, M11, at rate R10, uh, R11, such that the rate for the private message of user 1 is going to be the sum of the two rates. And then we basically deliver the M10 part of the message for user one into the common message. So we create a new common message, which is in fact M0, M10, which can be uh, decoded by both users. And we use basically the, uh, the, the cloud centers, so the, 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 the auxiliary codebook U to encode this message. And then we use the satellite code words X to represent uh, simply basically the M11. So at the end, the satellite code words will, will encode uh, the, the triple M, M, M0, M10, which is the center cloud, and then M11, which is the satellite around that center cloud. Okay, so in this way, using standard superposition coding, we can conclude that, uh, well, this will be rate, uh, let's call it R2. So R2 is going to be uh, less than this mutual information is achievable. The, if I call this, this played the role of R1 in superposition coding with only private messages. And, and, uh, and this must be less than this mutual information. And then we have that the sum of R2 plus R1 is less than this. And this is exactly the same as, uh, say, superposition coding. 
and the achievability is uh, what we have proved at the very beginning of this of this chapter. Okay. So now the, the issue is that uh, we have an inequality, a system of inequalities that contains three variables, R0, R10, R11. And we want to collapse the system of inequalities such that we is described only by two variables, R0 and R1. And we know that R1 is R10 plus R11. Hmm? So first of all, what we can do is to make uh, R11 disappear by replacing R11 by R1 minus R10 because the sum R1 must be by construction R10 plus R11. Okay, so we have we rewrite the system of inequalities in terms of the three variables R0, R1, and R10. And our, our goal is to eliminate R10. So, given the system of inequalities, what is the system of inequalities involving only R1 and R0, which is equivalent to this? And this sort of elimination of variables in system of inequalities goes under the name of Fourier-Moskin elimination procedure and, in fact, is very uh, in, very nice to see how it works in general and if you apply this procedure to this system of inequality you end up exactly to these inequalities okay um, so now we see in the appendix how the fourier moskin elimination works in general and then we apply it to this case as an exercise in order to uh, to go from this system of inequalities contains uh, R10 to this system of inequalities where R10 has disappeared. Okay? So, by the way, here in the appendix you also find the uh, Caesar sum identity uh, and the proof of the Caesar sum identity. As you can see, it's not a very long proof, but uh, it's something that, uh, if you don't see it, uh, is hard to believe because it's highly non intuitive, at least to me. Okay. So let's talk about fourier moskin elimination. So imagine a system of linear inequalities in Rd. In general, linear inequalities are in the form Ax less or equal than B, because when you write this for every, uh, so you have sum from J1, N, and you have A, I, J, X, J, less or equal than B, I, and this is for I from 1 to N. Okay. Oh, it's an RD, so this should be B. Okay. So we have a certain number of inequalities in RD. These define every inequality is an, uh, define a half space. So you take the intersection of all these half space, uh, half spaces, you get a, what is called a polyhedral region in RD. If R is bounded, this is called polyhedron. Like for example, a polymatroid is a polyhedron because it's a bounded. Uh, region in uh, in the d dimensions with uh, you know bounded by uh, by hyperplanes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want to eliminate one variable without uh, loss of generality. We can say okay, we want to eliminate uh, x one. So we want to find the projection r prime of the region identified by the system of inequalities uh, into a, the lower dimensional space mm, uh, in so d minus one dimension uh, that involves all the variables but x1. So in other words, we want to find the set R prime of all the possible d minus one tuples x2, R, xd, such that x1, x2, xd are in R for some x1. Hmm? So that's basically the picture in when these two, so we have a two dimensional picture. So in this case, we have one, two, three, and four inequalities. The region, our polytope, is 
the region R is this. And supposing we want to eliminate x1, in this case we would find the projection of this polytope on uh, the lower dimensional space that contains only x2, which is in fact this interval. Okay. So you see that for every point in this interval, there is a point x2, x1 in the region. Or vice versa, for every point in the region, for some x1, well, this corresponds, this is the x2 corresponding, and this interval is in fact the, the region uh, uh, corresponding to this projection. Uh, so the idea is that we can partition the set of inequalities into three different sets. The set number one has the coefficient of x1 equal to zero. So these are inequalities that already do not involve x1. So those inequalities can be simply replicated to the new uh, set. Uh, to the, 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 the projection, because they already do not involve x1. Then we have inequalities for which the coefficient uh, of x1 is positive. Those inequalities provide upper bounds on x1, because when we somehow solve for x1, we find x1 less or equal than this quantity, and because we are dividing by the coefficient a i1, so the coefficient of x1, and this is positive, the verse of the inequality here is preserved. So these are co this gives upper bounds. For all inequalities in group 2, we get an upper bound to x1. And then we have the third set of inequalities for which the coefficient of x1 is negative, and this gives lower bounds, because when we solve for x1 and we divide by a negative coefficient, the verse of the inequality is reversed. Mm -hmm. So this provides lower bounds. And at the end, and you see that the, these bounds are uh, expressed in terms of all the other variables, from 2 to d. So of course, what happens? In the new the, the inequalities that define the new set R prime, all the inequalities in group one that do not contain x1 are simply replicated. And then we obtain new set of inequalities by uh, simply imposing that every lower bound, so every uh, every term in a uh, in this group must be less or equal than every upper bound terms in this group. So suppose that, uh, for example, we have like two inequalities here and three inequalities there, we end up with six new inequalities by imposing that uh, each of these three terms must be less or equal than each of these two terms. Okay. Um, of course, at the end, many of these inequalities may be redundant. So the, uh, in this way, we, ex we somehow blow up the number of inequalities, but then we have to do some reduction and identify what inequalities are redundant. Because, you know, in general, if I have, for example, you know, inequalities that define this region, and maybe there is another inequality that defines this, okay? And, the, and, and, and this clearly is a redundant inequality. Will, uh, will uh, this half... Uh, half space contains already the region, so having or not having this inequality doesn't change the region. So this means that we all the all the inequalities that do not provide a facet in the in the in the polytope or in the polyhedral region can be eliminated. So we have uh, uh, not only expansion of the number of inequalities but also a reduction, and this is perhaps the most difficult part because the reduction. But you have to be careful and see how to reduce the inequality to the bare minimum that do not that the, for which removing any inequality you're actually changing the region. Mm. So here is the example for the degraded uh, message set. 
So our inequality is uh, obtained by superposition by direct by rate, rate splitting and uh, a direct uh, uh, application of superposition coding where this. Then we have eliminated uh, R11 by simply writing it as R1 minus R10. And so we have this set of inequalities. This is a inequalities in three dimensions because we have three variables, R0, R1, and R10. And our goal is to eliminate R10. So now we see that we have this is uh, lower bounds. These are upper bounds, and these inequalities does not contain R10, and therefore uh, the new set eliminating R10 is obtained by imposing that every lower bound is lower than every upper bound. So we obtain, for example, by taking this lower bound less than this, we have this inequality. Then if you take this lower bound less than this, of course we have the, these uh, rather trivial inequality that uh, R0 is positive. Then by taking this lower bound, the second lower bound, less than that, less than the, the first upper bound, we have this inequality. And finally, taking uh, the second lower bound less than the, uh, the second upper bound, we have this inequality, right? So now that's obvious. This is obvious because R1 and R1 simplify and we have that mi uh, the, the minus mutual information is negative, which uh, is not, say non-positive, which is uh, clearly obvious. So at the end, the only relevant uh, uh, inequalities that remains after elimination are this one, the first, and the second, uh, by simply rearranging terms, we get R0 plus R1 less or equal than, uh, than this. Okay? And in addition, uh, we also have the third inequality. We have to uh, add R0 plus R1 less or equal than the mutual information between X and Y1, right? which was uh, this one. And now if you, if you take uh, these three inequalities that involves only R0, and R1, we have that this is exactly exactly the region that we wanted to show to be achievable, which is, where is it? Is here. Huh? We have exactly this region. Okay. So we have uh, uh, used the Fourier, the, this rate splitting. We have uh, uh, somehow expanded the number of rates because we have split the message into some messages and but then we can eliminate these sort of partial rates and go back to a set of inequalities that involve only the rates that we are interested in by fourier moskin elimination and this is a very common procedure that happens uh, many times in multiple information theory where um, we can uh, basically construct coding schemes by you know adding by splitting messages in various ways and then we can put things together at the end uh, by using this this procedure there is even somebody who has uh, written a, a matlab say symbolic uh, calculator for uh, doing fourier moskin elimination in information theoretic problems the difficulty in uh, applying fourier moskin elimination in, uh, uh, in uh, information theoretic problems is in the uh, uh, reduction of redundant inequalities because sometimes it's not so evident in this case it was very easy to eliminate the inequalities that are redundant because uh, it's basically rate as positive mutual information are, are non negative and therefore it's easy to eliminate these two in more complicated cases, it happens that some inequality seems to be uh, non unrelated or uh, not, not clear that they are redundant, but after applying information uh, theoretic identities, so basically breaking down mutual information terms using chain rules, maybe imposing certain Markov chains that are in, intrinsic into the problem, uh, you can show uh, that in fact there are some inequalities that are redundant and can be eliminated. And this is the difficult part where you have to combine the Fourier-Moskin elimination with all possible 
manipulation of information theoretic quantities in order to uh, identify the redundant uh, inequalities and eliminate them. Okay, so this is uh, this is it. Uh, this is what I wanted to say, and um, this is uh, the end of chapter eight.